Z-World Orlando is celebrating an extraordinary milestone. 60 years ago, the first ever SeaWorld Park opened in San Diego, California, marking the beginning of a journey that would inspire minds, touch hearts, and protect marine life for generations to come. SeaWorld's 60th anniversary celebration isn't just a marker of time. It's a celebration of progress, innovation, and our unwavering commitment to the wonders of the ocean. And today, as we embark on the next chapter of our journey, we invite you to dive deeper, explore further, and discover so much more to see at SeaWorld Orlando. Hello everyone, and welcome to Seaport Theater. While inside, smoking is not permitted. And for the safety of our animals, please refrain from the use of flash photography. If you need to leave at any time during the show, please exit up the stairs where an operations ambassador will assist you. And now, SeaWorld is proud to present Rescue Tales. Hello everyone, and welcome to our very first Rescue Tales. My name is Billy Jean, and I'm just one of over 350 animal care specialists right here at SeaWorld Orlando. And I have the best job in the whole entire world. Where else can you get up every single morning, get to take care of animals, and be able to have the opportunity to share them with all of you? I'm so excited to share these amazing animals through our rescue center and highlight the, the, the amazing bonds that we have formed with them. Now, animals, big or small, play a vital role in their ecosystem. By not only understanding them, we can also contribute to their counterparts beyond our care. Now this show, I'm gonna ask, we're gonna be a little interactive. We're gonna have some questions. Kids, if you guys know the answers, I wanna hear it, okay? okay. All right, all right. With that said, are you guys ready to have some fun? Yeah! Let's shine a spotlight on our animals. I want you to meet Boris. Boris is our 17-year-old Asian small clawed otter. They're native to lakes, rivers, streams, ponds, rainforests of Southeast Asia. Out of the 13 different species of otters, Boris here, he's actually the smallest. Yeah. They're in the mustelid family, which means they're related to skunks and weasels. However, they are the only true amphibious species in the weasel family. Can you guys think of something that they might have in common with weasels and skunks? <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, he's marking right now. He is scenting, and that's something that he does have in common with them. But what's interesting is that scent that Boris has is unique to him. It's like us with our fingerprints. Yeah. Now, otters have some amazing adaptations that make them perfectly playful and super comfortable in the water. My favorite is, because I hate having water up my nose, I was at Dolphin for a while, but my favorite is his ears and his nostrils can close and make them waterproof. Yeah. They also have very dense fur that keeps them warm. It's about 450,000 hairs per square inch. And I, I think he, he must have been wet before he came here because he's trying to dry every single one of them. <laughs> it's going to take a while. <laughs> and as their name says, small claw. Their small claws are partially wet. They use them to dig around the dirt, build burrows, and this actually helps promote plant growth and nutrient cycle. Otters are typically found in really large groups, 13 or more, consisting of a male and female, a monogamous male and female. Monogamous just means that they're together for life. Yeah. Now when they're raising their baby otter, wait, I got a question. What are baby otters called? Anybody? Pups? Yeah, that's it. We got some smart kids. Yeah, okay, so they're called pups also known as kits, and about a month, well, when they're born, their eyes are closed, completely closed and helpless for about a month. Then around three months of age, these, 
these pink yarders will start exploring their environment, getting really super playful, venturing close to the water. Do you guys think that otters can swim naturally, baby otters? No, yeah, you're right over there. They can't swim naturally. Their parents actually have to teach them to swim just like us. Yeah. Otters here, they're not currently on the endangered species list. However, they are still considered vulnerable due to habit, a habitat deforestation. So at this point, you're probably thinking, well, how can I help, right? We can, I got a couple of things. We can um, try to go paperless. We can choose reusable items. When we're at the grocery store, we can label read and find those products that have sustainable palm oil. Yeah, all of those things can have a huge impact on the wildlife and help maintain the rainforest and, and everywhere Boris and his friends are found. You know, I appreciate Boris and Heather. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Let's hear it for Boris. Now we're going from the water to the sky. I want to introduce to you Cassandra and her friend, Olive. Hi, everyone. This right here is Olive. Olive is a crested caracara. And what that means, that means that she is a type of ground falcon. Now, when you guys think of falcons, usually you think of peregrine falcons, right? Yeah, peregrine falcons are pretty fast. They're, it's actually the fastest animal on the earth. They can fly at speeds of over 200 miles per hour. But ground falcons right here, they have different adaptations. So Olive, if you take a look at her, she has those incredibly long legs to help her to run around on the ground and even be able to dig around in burrows and take care of small pest animals. And she is actually a raptor. Raptors are the types of birds that we can consider keystone species. She's a very important part of our ecosystem here in Florida because her species helps us to know how other animals are doing in the wild. For example, she takes care of pest animals like rodents and rabbits, and those animals will eat smaller, more of a vegetarian diets, and it's all part of the circle of life. So it's very, very important to have birds like Olive around. Olive is actually a rescue, and she was found right here in Florida. And this is one of the many native species that you'll be able to find right around here in our native environment. Now with that being said, she unfortunately is an imprinted bird, so she is non-releasable. She'll get to spend her life here, and we've been the lucky ones who get to call her her home. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Now with all of here, we're very lucky to have had the opportunity to spend the last 17 years of her life with us. And 17, that's pretty old, right? Not really, these birds can actually live up to 30 years both in the wild and in human care. So we're hoping that she has a nice long happy life for the rest of her long happy life. Now, in just a moment here, I'm going to introduce, we're gonna say goodbye to Olive, and we're gonna introduce my friend, Justin. So, bye Olive! <laughs> State of Florida, what's the first animal you probably think about? The alligator. I made it really easy for you, didn't I? The alligator right here. So with me, I have Everglade. She is a young female alligator, and she's about a year old. Now she may be small, but adult alligators can reach lengths of 13 feet and weigh between four and 600 pounds. I mentioned that Everglades was a year old, but their lifespan is anywhere between 35 to 50 years in the wild, and upwards of 80 years in managed care. Now you've probably seen an alligator before, and that's because they're pretty common in the southeast United States, from Texas all the way down here to Florida. You can find these guys in freshwater habitats like lakes, rivers, streams, even ponds at your local golf course. Do we have any golfers in the house? A couple over here, I think. Have you guys seen them on golf courses before? Yeah, I, I just saw a video on the 17th hole. It wasn't moving. Now, alligators have been around for an astonishing 250 million years. And I think they're still looking great. I wish I had the skin if I was around for 250 million years. But over that time, they have become formidable apex predators. This is because of two distinct features their armored bodies, and their powerful jaws. Has anyone heard the term osteoderm before? No. no, and that's okay. It's a big, fancy word 
that basically means bony plate. So along the back of their uh, backs, they are lined with these bony plates that we call osteoderms, and that acts as a protective shield against predators. And take a look at this jaw that they're most known for. Does anyone want to take a guess at how many teeth they have in their mouth at any given time? 20, I heard 20. 50, even more. 8,000, okay, that's a little high. They have 70, that's actually the closest I've heard. They have approximately 80 teeth, right there. 80 teeth in their mouth at any given time. And just like sharks, they're constantly losing those teeth and growing new ones. That means that an alligator is gonna go through between two to 3,000 teeth in their lifetime, which is pretty cool. Now, alligators are unlike any other reptile because they'll actually take care of their young for up to two years after they hatch. Female alligators will lay on ground nests and the temperature of these nests actually determine the gender of their young. If the, test, if the nest temperature is about 86 degrees Fahrenheit, they're mainly gonna be females, just like Everglades here. But if it's up to 93 degrees Fahrenheit, they're mainly going to be males. Now, alligators have a really cool story and it's one that I always like to highlight. Way back in 1967, way before my time, I know, they were actually listed as an endangered species. Now, unfortunately, this was because of habitat loss and overhunting. But after 20 years of continued conservation efforts, we were able to take them off that list in 1987, which was actually the same year that they became the official state reptile of Florida. That's pretty cool, right? That's awesome. Now, alligators have a really cool thing that they do, and they'll use this nice long tail. I know it looks small now, she looks small, but give it a couple years and this tail is gonna be nice, big, and powerful. And they're gonna use those tails to construct what we call gator holes. So gator holes retain water during periods of drought, and we've actually found that other species like birds and turtles will use these holes for food, water, maybe even a place to lay their eggs. So do we think that alligators are important for our ecosystems? Yeah, you're exactly right. Over the last few decades, we've learned how alligators and humans can coexist by giving them their space and not feeding them. And with all your guys' help, we can make sure that alligators stay off the endangered species list and continue to survive for another 250 million years. But I think it is time. We're gonna say see you later, alligator, to my friend Everglades. I know, I had to do it, didn't I? Because coming back out is Billie Jean with one of our feathered friends. After a while, crocodile. <laughs> Are you guys having fun so far? Okay, all right. Well, I want to introduce you to a very special animal ambassador. His name is Alfred. Come on out, Alfred. Oh. This is Alfred, and he is a great horned owl. They are native from the Arctic all the way down to South America. Huge region, yeah, they're found everywhere. Now when I look at Alfred, when I usually look, oh, hi, when I look at Alfred, he usually has these tufts of feathers sticking up on the top of his head, which look like horns, and that's where they get their name from. The big thing I, I always fall in love with when I look at him are his, his giant, beautiful yellow eyes, they're so, Big. It's kind of like us having two big grapefruit inside of our head. Yeah, they're so big, there's no room for the muscles that allow the eyes to move from side to side, up and down, just like us. So, owls have adapted to turn their head 270 degrees in either direction. And they can do this because they have 14 neck bones. When you and I, how many do we have? Yes, seven, we have seven. We can't turn our head all the way around. Now their hearing is exceptional. They can do this because they have what's called a facial disc. It's a group of feathers around the head. Let's do a really quick demonstration so you can see what I'm talking about, okay? So take your hands, cup them up like this, put them behind your ears, and listen. You see how that amplifies the sound? That's what that, that disc does, it amplifies the sound. They're so good at hearing, they can hear a mouse snapping a twig. They can hear a rabbit running under the snow at 75 feet. Yeah. 
Have any of you ever heard an owl fly? It's a trick question. Sorry, no. They actually have silent flight. They have comb-like projections at the end of their feathers that muffle out the sound of flight. Amazing. Add all of those adaptations that we just talked about, and guess what that makes? A formidable predator. It's kind of like having free pest control service. Yeah, they're found from the Arctic to South America. That's a lot of mice. It's very important to have these guys around. In fact, who do you think it benefits to have owls around? Farmers. Farmers? Agriculture? What about horse stables? Yeah, they love having these owls around. And in, in turn, that benefits us, right? Yeah, with the farmers, benefits us. Um, before Alfred leaves, I just want to tell you a little bit about his very special story and why he's with us here today. So in Alfred, it's something you don't hear a lot about. Um, it's called imprinting. When Alfred was found, he was a chick and he was abandoned and he needed help. So somebody took him into their home. They gave him love, they gave him care, they nursed him back to help. But what happened was imprinting. So Alfred didn't learn how to owl. You know, he didn't learn those vital skills necessary to survive in the wild. Imprinting occurs when the animal bonds with the human. Yeah, so we were called, hey, can you have Alfred for a forever home? And we said, absolutely. And here he is rocking out, being the best animal ambassador for his species. And that's Albert, right? So his story teaches us to respect wildlife. And when you do find a young animal that needs help, find that local licensed rehabilitator because ultimately they have the skills and the techniques to utilize with that animal in hopes of returning them into the wild. You guys, let's hear it for Albert. He did fantastic and handsome boy. Good job, thank you, Cassandra. Well, we've met some incredible animals today, haven't we? Yeah. As we conclude our journey through Rescue Tales, we are reminded that every creature, no matter how big or small, deserves love, compassion, and a second chance. Here at SeaWorld, we are so proud to offer that second chance, and for nearly 60 years, we have rescued more than 41,000 animals. And that's with the goal of rehabilitating and returning them back to their natural environments. In fact, this year alone, SeaWorld Orlando has returned 22 manatees and 31 sea turtles. Let's give it up for our rescue team and our veterinary staff. Yeah, they did a great job. They, they are doing a great job, but that job is never finished. Thanks to the dedication of our animal care staff and the unwavering support of compassionate individuals just like yourselves, these stories of hope and healing continue to unfold every day. Until next time, remember to cherish every tale, because within each one lies a story worth saving. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy your day here at SeaWorld.
believe him had a very good sense of humor. <laughs> 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 so, I, 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 I,